Hi, people. Hey, everyone. This is Mary over here at Image on the Page. <laughs> what? I didn't realize it was recording. It's been recording this whole time. <laughs> oh, my God. Oops. Oh. <laughs> you need to calm down a bit. Small warning. I am not on drugs. <laughs> Possibly sugar, but that is it. Thank you. All the amount of sugar in those brownies. Oh, my God. They're so good. And are you glad I... I convinced you to get them. Yes. Okay. For those of you who don't know, those brownies are chocolate brownies with white frosting with Oreo cookies on top. And more chocolate frosting. Yeah. For crack. Crack. They're really good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> These, I always have trouble with this, so don't. <laughs> hey everyone, this is Mary over here at Images on the Page. I'm here with my best friend, Jenny. I'm visiting her for the weekend, and we're here going to do a couple videos because she let me con her into doing it. Well, the first video we're going to do is a kind of discussion ranty video about Tempests and Slaughter by Tamora Pierce. We're both fans, although I am a bigger fan than her, because yeah. I've actually finished all of her books. Like someone who hasn't read half of her series. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but she has read Tempest and Slaughters, which is of the Tortal world. If you haven't seen any of my other videos where I talk about Tamora Pierce, which is like every other video on the face of the planet, <laughs> um, the Tortal is more of a traditional fantasy medieval world, and there's the Circle series, which is set in Emelon, which is kind of more renaissance and the vibes more Victorian-ish, and the, the magics are completely different, too. Um... So Tempest and Slaughter, you can hold it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tempest and Slaughter is actually really hard to read. Right? Like, you can't tell it unless it's Hold it. Like you can hold it real close if you want. Like it. Yeah. There we go. Look at the feather. Look at it shine. Um, so this is about Numair in his years at the Carthag University before he became Numair. And if you want to know more about it and how I feel about the book without being spoilers, go check out my review. I will link the video down below. So... What did you, what ra what rating did you give this book? <sighs> I should have known you were going to start with that. Um, I don't know where else to start. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really liked it. Um, but? But I, I think it threw me off. I was expecting a lot more action in it. Because it's called Tempest and Slaughter. Like, you expect for things to get real and stuff to go down. And this is my version of not swearing. <laughs> Jenny, go ahead and swear. Okay. And I really don't care. I'm giving her full reign to swear a lot. And so... We're going to see how this goes. I'm going to do my best for you. Okay. So anyway, um, you really expect for stuff to get serious and for like the world to sort of start ending. And in fact, nothing really humongous happens. It's like the start of things, like the start of the problem. It's more like... It's not the calm before the storm, but it's like when you first get the little pitter paddles of, like, rain, and you know that there's going to be a thunderstorm, but the thunderstorm hasn't hit yet. Mm -hmm. That's what this book is. But you expect a lot more. And I think part of the problem is, is a lot of it has to do with Carth Carthac and, like, or Knew it! Or Ozorn. Ozorn. <laughs> Ozorn and his family, and, like, what's going on in the Emperor's family. Mm -hmm. And Numer's not really a part of that. Like, he's Ozorn's friend, but, like, he doesn't have a lot of, to do with, like, the political side of things. So, like, it's just kind of, like, in his peripheral vision that all this is going down. Right. So I think that's part of the problem, too. But it is really cool to see all of his training, and all of the mage work, and walking through rivers, and the different gods that pop oh, up. Oh, yeah. And then he meets an alligator god. He he's does. really sassy. Extremely sassy. He's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> There's a graveyard hag. I don't know if NC wins the sassiest award. She just... See, but you only think she wins the the sassiest award because you know her from previous books. Nice. From the Immortal series. Pissed off at Ozorn in the third book. And she really likes him in this book, which is funny. That is true, yeah. She hasn't quite worked up the level of rage that we get to later. I don't think she's there yet because he's still a good boy. That is true. He's still behaving. He's getting a little crazy at the end, though. He's like, how I'm going to rule the world with an Yeah, how fist. did you <laughs> feel that went out with him going, like, being pretty, like, level-headed and saying to him all of a sudden, like, wanting to rule the world and hating all Shiraz? I think that's how they say it when I listen to the audiobook. Okay, cool. Yay, audiobooks. You actually hear these things. <laughs> yeah, that's how I know how to say oh, oh. No, I don't. Ozorn's name. Okay. This is a lie. We have no idea how to pronounce any of this. We know how to pronounce none of this. Yes. <laughs> what was the question? Um, uh, how, how do you feel like that was handled? Him kind of 
like becoming a little bit unhinged towards the end. I think it's kind of interesting because you only get to see it in from Numera's point of view. You never really get to see it from his point of view. So you slowly like watch him going from this kid who just wants to learn about magic and become a mage to this guy who might actually he's he ends up being the heir not like the first one to become prince but the heir to the guy who's going to be prince so he's actually got a chance at no i think he's but i mean i i thought that was i did think that was a really interesting point because like there's this part where ozorn gets kind of in what i felt like was a deep depression Mm -hmm. and his physician his like teacher but he was also like his physician Mm -hmm. which that was a weird combo but comes and like helps him and all of a sudden he's better so like i was always wondering if it was like an underlying issue from the start and they just gave him something to kind of hide it Mm -hmm. or if it's something that is getting worse like with his mom okay and i don't think she okay sure that's how i say it on this one so i don't know okay we're gonna learn together okay (laughs) so i think chioki sorry plays a very large part in ozorn becoming more and more messed up yes hardcore he that guy is just a few fresh words of a happy meal. Well, he, he's not. He's actually really sane. He's power hungry. That is true. His political because, injury. Like, is... I knew as soon. I'm touching the table with my foot. I'm playing with the, your coasters. Hi, we're wiggling. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But like the minute he teaches Numer, and he was like, "You don't know how to," or like, "You don't know how to do this or that," and he's like, "I want you to throw fire." And then, like, at the end, he's, like, with this amount of power, he become a battle mage. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's all he could think about was, like, this guy, like, using his power to destroy things. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I was, like, oh, no, this isn't going to be good. Yeah. And then that's sure. not, because I'm pretty sure he's the one who killed Numer's teacher, the one who ran away. Yeah, I'm, like, 900% sure that he's the one who killed her. I can't say her name. Fazy. Fazay? F-A-Z-I-Y. Let us know what you think the name is. Wait, you can't tell us how you think the name's pronounced. I think that was interesting. I don't know how I feel about him, Ozorn, having, like, a possible mental illness. I That could be me inferring that. But, like, the fact that he went to a really dark depression where he, like, didn't want to talk to anybody, didn't want to see anybody, didn't go to class. Mm-hmm. And then he gets, like, this medicine that makes him all better. And then he's kind of, like, descending into this, slight like, madness. I'm just kind of like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. I think both he and his mom definitely have... They have something going on. His mom, for sure. Mm-hmm. Because she has... She almost has, like, this delusional thing where, like... She, like, thinks some people are still alive. Is that right? Um, it's... She knows her husband's dead. Yes. And so she wants Ozorn to go and kill everyone who killed her husband. Even though everyone who killed her husband is already dead and gone. Yeah. But she just wants him to take out she the She wants the whole race, race gone. gone. Pretty much and so he's genocide. been kind of like raised on that mentality. Yeah. It's and it problem. gets, some, there's some pretty dark moments where like something happens with another. There was the student in the classroom who's from that nationality. And then there was that poor beggar in the road where he was oh, just a poor beggar. ass to. Yeah. I had like, so much trouble with that part. I did too. That was really uh, difficult. Ozorn, like, beats the shit out of this beggar in the street that's of the race that killed his dad. For no reason. Okay. Like, he just saw him. So this poor man, he accidentally... This is at the point where... Or... or live in Egypt. Ozorn has become the second heir. And so he's got guards surrounding him all the time. And so this poor old man is at the wrong place at the wrong time. And he's old and he's got a giant like chunk of wood on his back that's probably like this big by gay big and it's just huge and this old guy is old. And he trips, which is what people do, particularly me. And so this poor guy, he just goes flying through the crowd and goes straight through the guards because the guards have no idea what the fuck they're doing. Like that was really bad guarding. And he just bumps right into the prince. And then everybody freaks out afterward. Nobody does anything beforehand to stop him from hitting the prince. And then the prince figures out that he is from this race and starts literally beating the crap out of him. And then Numer actually has to protect this poor guy who's getting the beaten out of him. And it's ugh. Yeah, it's really rough. This is what this video is about. Okay. Ranting about it. Yeah. Huh. Yep. But yeah, I had a definite issue with that. My biggest issue, and I know this was a big issue for you, was, well, in variation, how much we're stuck inside Numer's head. Yeah. There's so little action that happens. Especially, uh, okay, so like. Tamir. Tamir. <laughs> English has been real hard today. The words aren't working well. No. Please stay with Tomora, us. Tomora, Pierce, um, is really no, known for like being really. I've said this in my other video. Being really frank with like, especially like what girls go through going through puberty. So she does the same in Numer's book. 
She tries to do the same in Numeris book, but you need to understand that female puberty and male puberty are slightly mildly different. Like, for the female one, all of a sudden you just have blood <laughs> coming out of various places you didn't know they could come out of. And if you're not expecting it, it's quite frightening. Scary and painful. Not false. And then you've got Numer, who you you just, it's... You can say boner on my channel. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's not even the worst part. It's It's really bad, like... I don't even read romance books that often, but it's really bad romance book wording. Like, his member. Like, yeah. What the heck? It's like trying to beat her on the bush without calling it his penis. And it's just like, for once, just call it his penis. Right? And so you hear every single time this kid gets a boner for, like... Okay, so luckily she ends it at, like, halfway through the book, if not slightly before then. But for this whole, like, little part, it's all about, like, every single time this kid gets a boner. Like, he sees a pretty girl. The wind blows too hard. Like... Every single I'm really time. glad that they didn't. Have, she didn't have him masturbate. Yeah, yeah. I was. Ju I just thought that. I was just like, oh, well, that would have been bad. Yeah, and so like the first time you see him getting an erection, he's like, eleven at this point. Maybe he's ten still. Which I that part I didn't have an issue with because like I was expecting it, and I would have been more surprised if she had kind of cut around it. Mm -hmm. But then it continues. Yes, and like. I have talked to you guys about this now because I'm like, is there really something that happens? She actually talks to her husband about yes, this. Yes, I talked to my husband and I got he got a really weird phone call because he was out of town for that moment and it was majestic, I'm sure. And so I was like, so, does this actually happen when you're 10? Do you not know about this stuff? But yeah, we're awkwardly following this kid as he's, it's not even, it's just like randomly put in there like, he's sitting next to this pretty girl and oh my god, his pants are bulging and blah 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 blah. And you're like, okay. Like, I have heard cool. that that happens to guys though. No, that does happen to guys and it's fine. I just feel like it was very like awkwardly thrown in there. And they never talk about the way he responds to things like that later on. It's only in like that one little section where it's yeah. like, he's got a boner, he's got a boner, he's got a boner. Woo! So it's just... So. Well, he, yeah, that happens for like the first half. But then she gets over it, which is wonderful. And he gets his life together, and he realizes what boner is, and continues. Do you want to know if Jenny's caressing the book? I am. It's... What was your favorite scene? How about we go with yours first? Um, when he's in, he's doing the healing in the arena. Oh. Yeah. I felt like that was the perfect <sighs> amount of like being in his head, but him still doing something. Mm-hmm. And like he has to live with these people who are slaves, who are just like pushed out to fight for the pleasure of someone else because that's what the emperor wants it and he has to patch them back out to go back out and possibly die and it's him dealing with that while still doing it like while mm -hmm. still healing people and i thought that was like the best she's like writing at her best when she does that mm -hmm. like it's so fluid and it's so smooth and like oh yeah and like we're in his head just enough but like we're not stuck in his head like when he's in school or something like that and it's just like all about I mean, I really like knowing what he learned, mm -hmm. but, like, I feel like there was just, like, really long periods where it was just, like, oh, we're in his head forever. But that was definitely one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, that's a really good scene. I like the part where the one woman he knows, who he met earlier, and he is oh, freaking out she's because... a she's another um gladiator. Okay. And she's an older gladiator, I think. Yes, and she's the one who was sold to her husband at 10 who's infertile and then was sold back into the games and has gone through like all of this crap and yeah. been beaten up and you hear all of these slave backstories and so you get more and more understanding of why New Mare is against slavery so much Yeah, and you start to see New Mare and Ozorn like butting heads because New Mare wants slavery to end so badly like he sees how terrible it is he sees how terrible these people are treated and no one in his opinion should be a secondhand citizen Versus Ozorn, who is just like... He's looking at it as an economy. Yeah. As like product that brings his country money. That's how he's looking at it. Like for the good of his actual people, this needs to happen. And he doesn't consider the slaves like part of his country. Like they're just, they're like grain to be bought and sold mm -hmm. as needed. And like that is a really cool thing, how like how close Numer gets to the slaves. I mean, it's heartbreaking to hear their stories. Another thing that was super interesting was, like, the ju juxtaposition of, like, the university learned mm -hmm. mages and the, like, tribal mages, as they call them, uh -huh. who, like, the teacher who died, how she believed in the lightning stakes, and he was yeah. like, oh, no. Chioki was like, oh, no, that's, like, a folk tale or something, but, like, mm -hmm. Numeric saw it. Right. And, like, all the other things that he learns mm -hmm. that isn't, like, 
university approved. Yeah, I really like the tribal magic pieces for sure. Um, everything that happens with the water training, uh, she's also tribal magic. Yeah, almost all of his teachers are, except for his main teacher. Mm-hmm. But his main teacher is like so. He Cosmos? Cosmos. Cosmos. Well, I mean, he's the head, top, high, high. Yeah, he's like the head of the university. Of the university. We are murdering all the names in here today. Yeah. Thank you for staying here for this mass murder. <laughs> anyway. Um, and that's his like main teacher. Mm-hmm. But he is, I'm pretty sure he's university top, but he is real like. Cosmos is like the chillest person. Chioki's just like, oh, that's not worth learning, or that's not legit magic because it's not taught by university. I have so many issues with Chioki. Fun fact, he's my least favorite character. Oh, hardcore. He's like very derogative to anyone who isn't of his standing. Yeah, so pretty much. So pretty much, Ozorn's okay. He has to be okay with Cosmos because Cosmos is technically his boss. And he's after Cosmos' job, fun fact. Oh yeah, and that's it. That's like the only people he likes. And he kind of starts to like Numair at the tail end when he realizes he can throw fireballs like a bajillion miles away. I think he likes Varese too because he help, she helps uh, Ozorn's mom. But like yeah, that's he it. Does like Varese. That's it. Everyone else, he's like a shithead too. Mm-hmm. It's just like he feels so entitled. Yeah, and for some weird reason he just thinks he's better than everybody and he's trying to get in with the queen, okay, the new Ozorn's mom, the king all the heirs. He's trying to get his hands into everybody's business. Yup. Uh, I never said my favorite scene. No, you didn't. Do I have a favorite scene? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I really like all the parts where he's learning new magic, which is most of this book. So that's exciting for me. Um, I do but... actually love that part. It's just like so cool to see all the different magics that Tamar Pierce comes up with. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of the lightning snakes. They were mentioned earlier. The scene with the lightning snakes where he's like, um, we should probably get going. We should really get going. We need to get inside. And then they're like, no, we're not even paying attention to you. And then all of a sudden, like, lightning snakes come down and they're like, holy shit, this guy's being touched by lightning and it looks really weird and they're like kind of crawling over him. Through this whole thing, I was just like, where was all this magic in the Immortal series? (laughs) Where was all the magic that he can do in here in the Immortal series? (laughs) I don't need to reread that series because I'm trying to be like, this is some pretty awesome magic. Does he does he do anything? No, he doesn't. Oh. oh my gosh. Any scene where he pulls water out of the ground, I am a big fan of. 10 out of 10. Because um, he uses it at the very beginning when he's trying to get more water into the bowl to show the teacher how much of a badass he is, which is not false. He is. And mostly because he's super concentrated and he's just looking for water anywhere, pulls it out of literally minimum 20 feet down at like base water level under the school and takes it straight up and then in this one when ozorn is five steps from death's door and a dude's about to shank him um he also in turn brings out a giant fountain of water but it's like a t- it's like a it's, it's, it's not a, like a fountain like a who it's like a, it's like someone knocked over a fire hydrant at least that's how i imagined it yeah no that's true because it takes this big huge guy and sends him up flying the and roof, yeah. Knocks him out. Do you think this would change how you have read it if it came out before the Immortal series, knowing what you know, how Numeria and Ozern are in the Immortal series? Um, so now that I have finished it, I actually have the intention of literally going and picking up Wild Mage to see exactly what the relationship is like in that, now that I have all this. Because in that, I really don't remember it the way I should, which is a problem. And so I really want to go back and see exactly what the relationship is like, and I kind of feel like Numer, he does magic. But he doesn't do magic like he does in here. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. I'm kind of wondering when he leaves. Um, I think they said in something with something with something with something. Anyway, I was Googling this because I was once more curious. I think he leaves at like 21. Whoa. Yeah, so he's got a good long chunk of time here still. What? <laughs> so, so, he, well, so he has a lot of time. I thought he left when he was like 18. I thought it was something like that too, which is probably why I Googled it. But, <laughs> and so I thought he didn't run away from Carthag to like 21. Oh, my baby's got a lot of time left to get fucked up. And I thought this was only a duology. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping it's a trilogy so we can have him leaving and then his first years in Tortal. Yeah, because at some point they talk about it. And he's, he's like, he has to be like a juggler at some point. Yeah, and he like tries not to starve on the road and like, yeah. he's trying to live his best life while not doing magic, which is real tough for a kid who only knows how to do magic. And... But I really want to know how he ends up leaving. Mm-hmm. Because Ozorn, that's another thing. Ozorn is really possessive. Yeah, that's of true. Of Numeria. He's like, we're all just going to... At first he's all like, oh, we're all just going to live together and be academics. And then as it, like, continues, it's not like we're going to live together as friends. Like, he's like, you're going to work for me. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, that's... And then, like, you're going to be mine. Like, you're my friend, right? Like, it gets really possessive, and so I'm, like, really kind of worried about how it's going to go when they if they start, as they continue to butt heads. Mm-hmm. And as, like, Numera's just, like... Because, like, at the end of this, he's, like, he's, he's, like, he knows he won't be able to stay. Right. And he's come to terms with that. But at the same time, he really... Like, you can start to see the struggle because they're his two best friends. And they're the only two best friends he's ever had. And they're the only two people who really understand him, which is another thing that happens in here because he's a kid genius. And so everybody else kind of treats him like shit. And so these are the only two people who actually treat him decently and, like, people ought to treat other people. And so they're his best friends and he can't imagine leaving them and he can't imagine life without them. And it's just, like, you feel really bad that... He's stuck in this moral situation. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm really curious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's all we have to say. On Tempest of Slaughter, we're just going to keep going off into random tangents. That is true, though. They don't make much sense. Sorry. So, until the next video, ta-ta for now. Bye. <laughs>